Matthew chapter 9. We'll be looking at verses 9 through 17 again this morning. But as you're there, put your finger there, and that's why I got you there. But I want you to go over to Luke. This morning we're going to talk about discipleship. And usually I have a little introduction, but I thought I'd read the scripture to you this morning. It's pretty clear. I mentioned it quite a few times before. Luke chapter 13, and we're going to look at verse 25. <clears throat> Nope, that's not it. No, I got the wrong one. I'll correct that for second service. Well, let me go by memory then. <clears throat> you remember Jesus talked about who's worthy for the kingdom of God and how if a man takes a plow in his hands and he begins to plow and he looks back, he says he's not worthy for the kingdom of God. In fact, he said that a man has to love less his father, his mother, his brother, his sisters, in order to enter the kingdom of God. And so this morning, we're going to talk about discipleship and what the cost of discipleship is. Now, we're all Christians, and we're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> but we're not all true disciples of Jesus Christ. You can be entering into heaven, but you can also be a carnal Christian. Paul's very clear about that in Corinthians. And what I want to do as a pastor and a minister of Calvary Chapel and of any church, and I know any minister would uh, like this, to see the body of Christ become all disciples of Jesus Christ and be on fire for him. And so if you have walked away, <clears throat> if you are walking backwards, then you need to turn around and walk back. If you are living in sin, struggling with sin, then you need to seek the Lord and surrender that sin to Him and begin to walk forward with the Lord and totally surrender your life to the Lord. So let's define what discipleship is before we get started here. Someone who follows another person or another way of life from your old way. It's another way of life. It's another way of thinking. It's another way of doing from your old life. That's what includes the discipleship. And who submits himself to the discipline, teaching of that leader in that way. So it doesn't matter what that is. If it is some organization, some government institution, whether it's religion or whether it's Christianity, if you become a disciple of it, you are submitting to that way. For us, we are following a leader, and that is Jesus Christ. We are submitting ourselves to him. In the New Testament, the term discipleship is, is found almost exclusively in the Gospels and in Acts. And so you see what true discipleship is by the disciples, really. You look at the life of the disciples, and you can find what discipleship is. And then you watch their lives in the book of Acts and, and how their lives are unrolled through the power of the Holy Spirit as they're ministering and getting the gospel out. Yet clearly, whenever there is a teacher and those who taught, the idea of discipleship is, is definitely there, present as they are listening, as they're taking in, and then as they're applying those truths to their lives. And that's really, the, the as McGee would say, the rubber that hits the road is the application to what we believe. So in the Gospels, the immediate followers of Jesus Christ, called by His authority, from a wide variety of circumstances. And so you look at the 12 disciples and some were fishermen, some were tax collectors, some were political zealots. Uh, they just came from all walks of life. And not just the 12, but, but the multitude that were there, the 120 that he also called, committed themselves to him and called themselves disciples of Jesus Christ. That's important. Do we call ourselves disciples of Jesus Christ? Do we first believe that this word is the word of God and we want to live by the word of God? The calling of these disciples took place at a time when other teachers had their disciples. For instance, the Pharisees or the Sadducees or even the Hellenists. They all had different philosophies and thoughts and they all had their disciples. But even John the Baptist had his disciples. And they were doing certain things that Jesus' disciples were not doing. 
And so they all had disciples, but we want to get back to what Jesus said. Now, it's evident from this practice of John the Baptist that different leaders were called to different disciplines. And we'll see that today in today's uh, text as John's disciples come to Jesus and they ask a question uh, about um, fasting because John did it differently than Jesus did. And so they were concerned that they were possibly doing it the wrong way or maybe Jesus was doing it the wrong way. We don't know. But John's way was... um, considerably considered to be self-denial in their fasting. They, they kind of mimicked the religious leaders, the Pharisees and so forth, who fasted uh, quite often during the week. And so they were following a religious system in fasting, and we'll see that also. But Jesus' way it was quite different and distinct from them all. So this morning, let me break up this, uh, these few verses for you as we, we go through them. We're going to see the call of Matthew by Jesus to follow him in verse 9. And then that call changed Matthew so drastically that he throws this dinner and invites all of his sinner friends to come and join them in verses 10 through 13. And then 14 through 17, uh, John's disciples come to Jesus and ask him about fasting. So these verses speak about discipleship and how important it is for us to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Discipleship means this. Something very different from anything that the Pharisees ever imagined. It was so in-depth. It was so powerful. It was life-changing. It was a whole different direction that these men would go. So let's go ahead and, and start this morning's text as Jesus asked Matthew to follow him. As Jesus passed on from there, verse 9, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now, I have highlighted two things here in verse 9. One, Matthew. He's, he's the noun. He's the person that, that this topic is speaking about. And that Jesus asked him to follow him. And so this man is confronted with Jesus. And Jesus' question what to him was and call was to follow me. Let go of everything you know. Stop what you're doing and come follow me. So let's build upon those two things. Now, all three Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and um, Luke, um, talk about this taking place immediately after the healing of the paralytic. You remember last week, the man's friends brought this man who was on a bed and they put him through the roof and Jesus forgave him of his sins first. And then he healed him to show the religious leaders that he had power to forgive sins. Because if a man can forgive sins and then heal someone, that man's got to be from God. And so Jesus uh, clearly states that he is God in the flesh there. And so immediately following that, he passes by from there to this man, Matthew, who is sitting at a tax office. Matthew's name means gift of Yahweh, or he was given a gift from God, and God is presenting a gift to him at this moment. So Matthew is basically introducing himself at this point to the readers, and he's talking about himself, a testimony of his own relationship with Jesus Christ here and how Jesus Christ has ministered to his own heart. Uh, All three of the Gospels uh, have Matthew sitting in his office there at the tax station uh, as they're collecting taxes. And Jesus possibly may have been coming by, paying some taxes, and Jesus turns to him and calls him. I remember the day that I got saved. It was in my company truck. I was sitting in my, it was at that time a little Ford pickup truck. And I was listening to the radio and the Lord called me at that moment. I had to surrender completely to him while I was in that truck. And there's been many people, I don't know how you've been called, who've been called right there while they're working while they're providing for their families or maybe while they're playing or, or maybe while they're in in some drastic horrific moment of time i i remember the testimony of raul reese where he was ready to just give up on life had a shotgun in front of him and ready to to kill his wife and then himself and then the tv comes on and he gets saved you know so um, we all get saved at different moments where god calls us uh, into discipleship so before his converse uh, conversion here matthew uh, worked as a tax collector levite was his jewish name (laughs) 
possibly came from the tribes of Levi, a priestly line, and he takes his name Levi and he turns it into Matthew, a tax collector. Just goes to show you sometimes where uh, we come from and then where we go and, and where we're heading in the wrong direction and then God comes in and interrupts that in our lives at times. Now, in those days, uh, tax collectors were very hated by the people. And that's important to understand in, in Matthew's calling here because he's making a decision here to follow Jesus that's going to cost him. <clears throat> the taxes in mind here are taxes that were levied on goods. You remember they came from <clears throat> um, Gardene down back through the Sea of Galilee into Capernaum, and there was a tax pole there because people would ship uh, goods in and out all the time there in the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. And, and, and so they would tax them. And so Jesus is coming back there and Matthew's sitting in his tax uh, booth and he's collecting the taxes on the goods as people are bringing in and out. It's how they made their, their living there. Uh, somewhere along the sea, there was probably a, a little port of some sort, not very big because it's, that area is not huge at all, but big enough that uh, small boats that have goods are selling fruits and various things uh, would come in and pay their taxes. And then and those taxes would, uh, a portion of them would go to uh, Herod and then also a portion to the Romans too. The Romans allowed Herod to, to do this. Did you know that about three to five months of, of your, your hard-earned income goes to paying taxes a year? You, you actually work three to five months for nothing and then you start earning your money at that point. That's high taxes, and it's, it seems to be getting worse. So you, you kind of get the feeling there of people that <laughs> at that time didn't like taxes at all, just like we don't like taxes today. You know, we, we don't understand that concept that if we free people from taxation, that, that actually it would cause the economy to grow even more because we spend more. That's, that's our habit. Uh, we like spending money, and so we go out, we have dinner, we buy goods and so forth, and it just creates more revenue throughout the world. But um, there are some that, that want to tax you so that others don't have to work and do anything, and they can you know, eat and, and be provided for. And I'm not talking about the ones that are ill or have problems, but the ones that are lazy. <clears throat> There was a set rate that um, the government had set at this time, but it was allowed for each person to set his own rate. And so Matthew could collect any amount that he really wanted to. So depending on how wealthy he wanted to get, he would set that amount. And so Matthew was probably a very wealthy person, and this is why they hated him. <clears throat> and it says, he said to him, follow me, so he arose and followed him. Now, that word follow in the Greek is important right here. Abiding fellowship with him. The word abiding is important. That means that you're abiding in someone. If you're going across the Sea of Galilee and you are in the boat, you're abiding in the boat. You're within the boat. You're in the, the, the protection of the boat, of the water. You're in that boat. You're abiding. So when we come to Christ and follow him, we are abiding in him. We're abiding in him, his ways, his statutes, his laws, his principles, his very being. And so we are literally making a choice to abide in him completely. Uh, that's what it means to make a choice to follow Jesus Christ. That isn't always explained. Sometimes we just do an altar call, accept Jesus into your heart, and you're saved, and you go off. And, and we go off, and we're not sure what does that mean. You know, Well, it means now you're making a choice to abide in him, to become a disciple of him, to really give him everything in your life there. So like this, Matthew is, is basically... Uh, minding his own business, he's making money, Jesus comes in and says, follow me, and now he has a choice, and the Spirit moves in his heart, and he literally follows and obeys Jesus at that moment. I mean, he just lets everything go. He doesn't think about it, he doesn't concentrate on what the consequences are, he just follows Jesus through the Spirit of God. It doesn't say uh, that the Lord was working on him before, you know, through people. Somehow the Lord had chosen him before the foundations of the world to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus came, whether it was his teaching, whether what he knew of him, whatever it was, Matthew dropped it all, left it all to follow him. Luke tells us in Luke 5, 28, that he left everything, everything. That implies a lot for someone that's very wealthy. He left his whole way of life, his taxation, his friends, his buddies, uh, his money, his wealth, um, 
his ideology. He left everything to follow Jesus. Because they were so wealthy, because they had so much, you can understand the difficulty it would be for someone to say, I leave it all to follow you. But he made that final decision to follow Jesus. But it wasn't just a matter of giving up of his resources and money. Think about this. <clears throat> he couldn't go back to it. <clears throat> tax collectors were hated by Jews. So the Jewish tax collector, knowing that, had a hatred for Jews and for those who they taxed. And so for him to then betray that system and go into this Judaism following Jesus and then come back and say, hey, I'd like to join you again. They're like, they would probably go, no, <laughs> you had your chance. You blew it. You're not coming back. So he gave up the possibility of even going back to work and he couldn't work anywhere else. He couldn't go down the street and work at McDonald's because there was a Jewish owner and the Jewish owner was taxed. And there comes Matthew and says, hey, I need a job. Oh, really? <laughs> You're the guy that's been taxing me. No, I'm not, I don't have a job for you uh, today. And so he couldn't have a job there. So when he surrendered everything, he surrendered everything unto the Lord completely. I, I remember when the day that the Lord called me to go full time into the ministry, it was a scary, it was a scary time. And, and by the way, I'm not saying that, that Jesus is teaching that you just, you know, get, quit work and all, all of that. I'm not saying that at all. This is Matthew's situation. Uh, we all come to that point if God's calling you into the ministry. And I came to that point where the Lord was calling me into the ministry full time and I had to give up. I had to give up my cushy job that I had. I was just speaking with a friend of mine that um, known him for years just this last week. He accidentally called me on the phone. And so we were talking for a while what's going on with, with Edison and, and, and so forth. And and I remember the, the day or the week after that I had quit, I had gone back to Edison to give some blood because I was a part of the donation, donating of blood there. And when they found out, they politely asked me not to come back onto the property because I wasn't welcome there anymore. And, and at that time, you remember, uh, there was a lot of incidences where people were going postal. Remember that? You know, they quit their jobs because they were mad or upset. You know, they go back into the office. And so everybody was on lockdown. When someone quit to someone left, you know, no, don't get them back in because we don't know what they're going to do. So it was that type of situation. So Matthew finds himself in a situation where he is totally surrendered uh, to the Lord. Uh, you can go back fishing, you know. You're a fisherman. Uh, you give it up. You follow Jesus. Something doesn't work out. Well, let's just go back fishing. You can do that. But tax collecting? You can't really do that. So he gave up a lot. What does that say about us? Because Jesus is asking us to follow him. It means that we need to give up. Not necessarily our wealth. Not necessarily our houses and our jobs. But we are to give up those things that are in opposition to our Christianity. Whatever those things are. Uh, may, you know, maybe you're into sports. And sports gets in the way of coming to church on Sunday morning. Maybe God's saying, you need to give that up and surrender Sunday mornings to me. Well, but I can worship on Wednesdays. That's fine. Then give it up and come on Wednesdays every Wednesday evening. At least you're coming. Because we don't want to get too legalistic in that. Uh, maybe you're a partier and maybe you like to go party with the gals or with the guys. And, so, and God is saying, you need to give that up for me and, and come party with my people and do a work in my community and see what I can do with you. And so God is asking us to, keep, to give up other things besides our wealth, besides our jobs. But God is always so asking you to give up your job for those of you he's calling. And if you are called to the ministry, if you have a heart and a desire to teach his word, if you feel that God is using you, then there, there will come a time where God says it's time to leave your job and go full time and trust in me. Maybe even to the missions, if you're called to the missions, God will say it's a time to trust in me and I will be your provider. I'm amazed at how God has provided for my wife and I uh, since I quit working. God is so good at that. So there is a part of our discipleship where we have to surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ. Understand that. Whatever that is, is in your life that is holding you back from fully following Jesus Whatever that is, it, it can be church even. 
It could be religion, and we'll see that in a moment, how religion can do that. You have to have the freedom to follow Jesus and serve Jesus, because Jesus wants to use you for his glory. So Matthew's so excited. We come now to uh, verses 10 through 13. Uh, he, he's excited about this uh, newfound faith. He's excited about Jesus. And now he's got this whole new career. Doesn't know what it entails. But he just wants to let people know. Uh, he, he's excited about it. Uh, I remember when I got saved, I just wanted to let people know. I, I was preaching to police officers. I, I would uh, get, to, get with my buddies and I'd, I'd tell them, you need Jesus. And they'd get on their knees and ask Jesus into their hearts. I would go to, to neighbors' homes and, and get them all to get on their knees and, and repent and give, get Jesus into their hearts. I mean, just excited. I'd, I'd have parties and people over just so they could meet my Christian friends and see that they're cool too and they need Jesus too. You know, they're not a bunch of wacko weirdos that, that the world portrays them to be. And so Matthew's kind of really excited about it. He says, now it happened as Jesus sat, verse 10, at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, I highlighted three things here in this text, and let's keep the, the text within the context here, right? He's talking about discipleship here. He just calls Matthew, and now we see Matthew as a disciple uh, throwing this party for what? Many tax collector sinners that came to eat. So, so Matthew's concerned about his friends who don't know Jesus, who don't have a relationship with Jesus, who are not yet disciples. Uh, he loves them enough to say, hey, I, I might be um, infringing on your liberties here. I might be in an area that you don't want to hear, but I want you to come and hear this man. I, I want you to come out and listen to him. You know, you don't have to be a great evangelist. Uh, you don't have to know the Romans road. You don't, you don't have to know the master's way. Uh, you can just say, hey, come to church with me and just sit with me and my family for a while and, and let's see if the Lord will minister to you. We have, I, I've been sharing with you, our, my mother-in-law is with us right now and she is, is not a believer and very hard to, to reach her. A very nice person, don't get me wrong, very nice, she's, she's not a mean person, doesn't you know, do things that, that you know, an atheist or a partier would do, just very nice mother-in-law, but she just has the whole religious thing. And so she's in our home, and, and I'm not witnessing to her, you know, let's sit down, let's go through Romans Road, you know, I'm not doing that, she's, she's already been through that in my younger, younger uh, age, when I was really on fire for the Lord, and just shoving it down people's throats, you know, and so uh, right now, it's just living it in front of her, and so she's seen the love, and the, and the different lifestyle that we have compared to others that she's lived with, um, and it's going to change her, I know it is, because I know our God is good, and when people really examine the evidence whether it's through them going through the bible or whether it's them by participating in a church and seeing the lives of people and that's how they can see things they can see this isn't as bad as i thought it was these people are not weirdos you know they just have a faith and a faith that actually helps other people that are involved actively in the community now she was blown away with the thanksgiving thing she just couldn't believe that that, that we were feeding these people on Thanksgiving Day. And so those are things that change you. And when you love people, you'll do that. You, you, will, you will not offend them, but you'll live your faith by them so that they, hopefully they'll come to know Jesus Christ. And so Matthew here was very concerned for his sinner friends. And he calls them sinner friends, right? The tax collectors who are hated and they're sinners, the publicans who everyone dislikes, you know, and I call them all together to sit down and have a meal. And then I also highlight in verse 11, why does your teacher eat with, with tax collectors and sinners? Religious people will always question you and your methods. If they are not biblical, they will question you on if you're doing it the right way. 
And these religious leaders are, are, are standing by him. They're watching what's going on. And, and to them, to sit and to eat with a sinner, oh, oh, that's you don't do that. That's like becoming one with that sinner. You, you don't go to dinner and put your hand in the bowl with a piece of bread and kind of get that... Uh, uh, whatever that sauce is, you know, and put it in your mouth. And then he puts his hand, a Gentile or a sinner or a publican, someone who's not religious in there and then eats again because now what you're saying is we both put our hands in there. We both are becoming one. So we're being a part of each other. And oh boy, I am not a sinner and I want to be a part of their life. And so, no, no, that's far from me. And so for Jesus to eat with them, that was a big no-no in their mind. And they question that. Why is Jesus eating with these tax collectors, with these publicans, with these sinners? Doesn't he know that he's defiling himself? He's not pious? Uh, Doesn't he understand the law? And by the way, these are traditions and not Old Testament laws. And, And we have to understand that here. These Pharisees and Sadducees and religious leaders have made up laws to define the Old Testament laws. And they're incorrect or they're very extreme. So here they've made up this law of being one through a tradition. And now they hold to it so tightly that anybody that does not hold to it must be totally wrong. Something's sinful about them to even eat with sinners. And then thirdly, verse 13 says, For did I not call, or did I not come to call the right to call the righteous but sinners to repentance? So Jesus makes it very clear here. Now he's quoting from Hosea, and he's quoting a scripture in the Old Testament there, and they should be very aware of this scripture and how God was calling the people of his people to come to him because he was a merciful God and that they needed to be merciful too. And he's reminding them that not only were they to be receiving the mercy of God, but they were to be giving the mercy of God to those around them, whether they were Jew or not. And so that's why he says, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so Matthew decision to leave everything was not a decision that was bringing some sort of remorse or sadness in his life it was a joyful decision in his heart he was looking forward to what God was going to do in his life so much so that he wanted others to participate in this newfound faith with him in the kingdom of God and eternal life and so he throws this great feast uh, before his tax collectors, his, in a sense, has a, a den of robbers and thieves that he invited over to dinner to hear what Jesus said. Uh, sometimes it's just inviting someone over to dinner, right? You know, getting to know them. I was sharing with you the family that uh, Virginia and I went over. Uh, their daughter used to play with our kids on the block. Uh, she'd come over all the time and they would you know, hang around and play football, whatever, in the backyard and things like that. Well, I guess she wanted them to go over to her house. Well, we just didn't do that because uh, we were very protective of our kids, especially their faith, and we didn't want them to be influenced by other things, and so uh, we really never let them go anywhere else. So one day she came to our house, and she wanted to know why that was. And we said, well, why don't we get together, and we'll explain it to you. And so we went to their house and and we began to explain to them why we don't allow them to go over, being very protective. And then we shared with them the reason behind that was because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And so we shared with them about Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. And I can't remember, uh, I don't think it was Romans Road, it's just off of our heart and what Jesus has done for us and so forth. In fact, this was a little girl that I had asked earlier do you know who Jesus is? And she said, where does he live? She had no idea who Jesus Christ was. She thought it was a little kid that lived in the neighborhood somewhere. And so when I explained it all, um, at the end I just said, would you like to receive Jesus into your hearts? And they said, yes. The whole family just said, yes. 
And so we all got on our knees because I wanted to really make sure it was real. I said, would you mind getting on your knees? And they said, yes. And they got on their knees and they uh, said the sinner's prayer. Um, and as far as I know, they are still serving uh, the Lord today. He owned a catering business, one of these trucks. And I heard that he was actually witnessing from his trucks, passing out tracks and, and various things. And so just inviting them to dinner, inviting them to an event, that's one of the reasons that we have the events that we have, so that you as the body of Christ, as disciples of Jesus Christ, can invite your friends, because I'm sure you have friends that don't know the Lord, relatives that don't know the Lord, that need to be introduced to the Lord. And those are the opportunities that, that you have to invite them out. The Thanksgiving situation, you know, the summer fest that we put on, the, the uh, harvest uh, carnival that we hosted just this uh, last Thanksgiving and, and, and so forth. Um, these are events where you have opportunities to share the joy that you've experienced with Jesus Christ also. And so these religious leaders... Didn't like that, didn't want to see it. And so Jesus kind of corrected them in a sense and said, I would rather see you have mercy than your sacrifices. God doesn't always look at our sacrifices. I was reading this morning in um, Corinthians. Uh, it's pretty profound when you think about uh, what Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 about love. Uh, when he... Um, gives a description of that greatest gift which is what love it's the greatest gift of all if there's a gift that, that you're desiring let it be love and, and he goes on and he says though i speak with tongues of men and of angels now think about that for a second anybody here speak uh with uh, tongues of men maybe a few of us i know i have the gifts of tongues uh, uh, maybe of angels anybody know if you speak in the language of the angels I'm not sure if my language is in the angels or not or different language you know but most of us here don't have the gift of tongues most of us here don't know if it's the it's a language of angels and yet he's here though you speak in those things and if you have not love it's nothing you go, whoa man, I don't even have that I don't even have the gift of tongues and yet oh boy so the greatest gift there is love he goes on and says, though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all, not just some, but all mysteries and all knowledge. Now imagine that. Prophecy. You're, you're able to prophesy. You know, you, you know what's going to happen in the, anyone here, you know, know, know that? Uh, I, have from time to time, have been given the gift of prophecy. Uh, my wife, uh, from time to time, has been given the gift of prophecy where we know that God is going to be doing a work soon and some people are going to be leaving, and, but if something fresh is going to happen, and we, we've seen that, experienced that, this gift of prophecy. But not everyone has the gift of prophecy. How about understanding everything? You understand everything? Well, you go, I don't even have that. But you can have love. But you can have love. That's the greater gift of all of those things. And then he goes on and says... If you could remove mountains, if you can remove, can you imagine that? Removing a mountain, moving it. Um, I don't know of anyone who has moved a mountain yet except God. I've heard of people say, well, if you have enough faith, you can move a mountain. And, and, and people even um, say that they have moved mountains, but it's only moved like a, a quarter of an inch, so you really can't notice it, you know. But they say they've moved it. Like, come on, really? If you can't move mountains, look, you've got to have love. That's the greatest gift of all. And that's what Jesus was saying here, right? I want mercy. I want love above all things um, than your sacrifices. Because you could be the, the biggest giver. And yet, if you're giving it without love, it's nothing. You could be the, the, the biggest uh, worker and servant here doing everything. But if it's in a grumpy old way, then it's nothing. God doesn't look at it. He wants you to do it out of love and especially reaching the lost for Jesus Christ. Now we come to uh, verses 14 through 17 as John's disciples um, see Jesus' disciples uh, not fasting. Not fasting, by the way. Uh, the, the Pharisees, the religious system, fasted. Mondays and Thursdays, you fasted. You sought the Lord for various reasons. It was a habit. It was the law. 
They took the Old Testament law and then they made it into a tradition and they made it into a, a burdensome law. And Jesus then comes along and his disciples aren't fasting at all. So that's a big no-no in what's going on in their life. So he says in verse 14, Then the disciples of John came to him. So that is John the Baptist. Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friend of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the day will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. Nor do they put a new wine or new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskin break, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Both are preserved. Three things that I've highlighted in these verses again stick with the context you have the disciples matthew's called to discipleship surrendering everything to jesus christ saying this is a new life a new way Uh, this is not the old way this is not the old system this is something new And, and then all of a sudden matthew invites his sinner friends the law comes into play and says you're doing everything wrong here you shouldn't be eating with sinners. You shouldn't be sharing with them. And Jesus says, no, I've come to bring mercy to all mankind, which was different than the law, which brought legalism and condemnation. And now all of a sudden, John's disciples come, and these are John the Baptist's disciples. You remember he came first, and he was baptizing, and he had a following And so these men were following John the Baptist. He was put in prison and his disciples were ministering to him. And this was where John all of a sudden said, you need to go to him because he had some doubts. You need to go to Jesus and find out if he's really the Messiah who said he was. And of course they came to Jesus and they said, are you really the Messiah? And Jesus said, go back and tell John that I am, that I am the Messiah. So now his disciples, John's, start following Jesus and they have a question. And, And, you know, as a disciple, we will always have questions. Um, when you first come to the Lord, uh, Jesus begins to work in your life. He begins to show you things. I think it's Ephesians that says that if you stole, steal no more. It's a changed life. Now, what you used to do, you shouldn't be doing anymore. If you used to drink a lot, you shouldn't be drinking anymore at all. Well, how can you say that? The Bible doesn't say you shouldn't drink. Look, you shouldn't be drinking. You shouldn't be getting drunk. Okay, I understand that I shouldn't be getting drunk. But the Bible says that I can have a drink once in a while. Yeah, if it doesn't stumble anyone. If it doesn't stumble anyone. Try drinking, not stumbling anyone. You've got to be in the closet to do that. Well, I can be in the privacy of my own home with my own family. Really? Well, you're stumbling your children then. Because your children are watching you. And they don't fully understand everything. But they're seeing dad's drinking. Oh, I can't wait to get at an age where I can drink. And that's why our children are walking away from our Christianity because it's not real to us. No, if you drank, you shouldn't drink anymore. You need to give it up. You need to surrender it like Matthew. I let it go. It's gone. If you party, if you hang around the wrong friends, you start hanging around the right friends. Well, wait a minute. You're saying I can't have friends? I think you've got to be like Matthew. You bring your friends to Jesus. You don't keep your friends to hang around with and party with. Paul was very clear in Corinthians that when you start hanging around corrupt people, it corrupts good morals. And so that's why our morals are still corrupt. And that's why we struggle with the church because we're thinking the church should think like us when the church is trying to get us to stop thinking like the culture in the world. And so um, we have questions, but when they're answered, you need to surrender yourself to Christ. Your life has to change. And it doesn't stop, by the way, just because you know the Lord 30 years now, you don't stop growing. I'm still growing in the Lord. There are still a lot of things that God is trying to remove from my life. You know, I used to be um, very closed as far as came to people. I, I didn't like to talk to people. I didn't like to be around people. I could sit in my home, in my own room, and just, I was fine. And, and God just changed that through his Holy Spirit to, to where I love being around people. I love hanging around people. It's not always good, but I mean, it, I just love doing it now. You know, I used to be very selfish. It was all about me. 
you know, and now I'm less selfish. I find that even at 30 years, I'm still selfish, but I'm less selfish, and I'm still learning how to be even less selfish. Uh, it's a hard thing to do to let go of self, because we love ourselves, Paul said in Ephesians. No man ever hated his own flesh, he said. And so to let that go, it's very difficult because no one else loves you the way you love you. Nor can they take care of you the way you take care of yourself. Uh, nor cater to you the way you want to be catered to, you know. And, and if anyone else comes around and doesn't want to do that, then they must not love you, right? Oh, you don't love me. I've, I've been through that. And, and that's a difficulty. I sometimes put that trip on with my grandkids, and that's just my old self. You know, say, C come over here and give me a hug. I mean, come on, Poppy's sick, but hug him because you love him. No, you're sick. I'm like, you don't love me. You really don't. Because if you really love me, you come over and hug me. And that's my old self, right? I don't realize I'm playing with them, but I'm not realizing that, hey, that's still that selfishness. You know? If someone doesn't give us what we want, you don't love me then. That's what it really means is you don't love me. Really? No, what it means is you're selfish. And you need to get rid of that selfishness. So, so God is always working in us and maturing us in our relationship with him. So the disciples like, this fasting thing, what's going on? You know, we're, we're fasting every week and we see your disciples. We kind of like that. We don't have to fast anymore. We can hang around you. And of course, uh, Jesus says in verse uh, 15 that when the bridegroom uh, is around, you know, no one's mourning. Everyone's rejoicing. In other words, I'm here, so why are we fasting? As long as I'm here with them, there's no need to fast. Uh, their needs are met. Everything that they, they uh, need, everything that they want, I'm going to take care of as I'm here. But there will come a time, he says, when the bridegroom will be taken away, and then they'll begin to fast. Now he's talking about what? The crucifixion, right? And this is where he tells his disciples, I want you to go wait in the upper room. And then wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm sure they were fasting up there waiting on the Lord. And they fasted, as you see, through the book of Acts for power and might. And fasting was used for all various reasons. But I didn't want to get into that uh, this morning. So, Jesus then gives this description. Two little kind of allegories that preserves both. Preserves what though? Preserves the old and the new. Matthew's old life, Matthew's new life. The disciples of John's old way of fasting, Jesus' new way of fasting, uh, the law and grace. And so he gives us a, a picture of, uh, of sewing on a new piece of garment on an old garment, of, of putting wine into old wineskins. You can't contain it because a wine skin has already been bloated and stretched by the wine that you can't put new wine in it or further stretched it otherwise it would blow up it doesn't work and so jesus is saying i'm doing something different that's what we're doing here uh, we're not doing the old thing the old thing had a purpose and there was a reason for the law and so forth and there are great principles in that but we don't follow the law anymore we apply some of the principles as long as they are interpreted by the New Testament, the new thing. And I've come to bring what? What was it? Mercy. That's what's new compared to the law. So in its context, Jesus here is talking about the law and grace. He's talking about his work on the cross for us and how he died for us. He gave his life for us. We didn't have to give our life for him. I love that last song because it talks about his love and his work sometimes we talk a lot about what we're doing and how much we love him but in reality it's how much he loves us and that's pretty amazing when you think about it so the old testament law would have said you want to be my disciple then this is what you have to do according to the traditions of the religious leaders you have to follow almost 500 laws and you have to keep them and you have to sacrifice when you don't keep them a lamb and by the way, when you bring your lamb in, we'll check it and see there's no spot, no blemish. And if there is, then you have to get rid of that one and buy ours, you know, and then you can offer up that lamb and then you'll be clean. As long as you don't sin again, then you've got to do the process all over again. And what a burden that was. Uh, and on the Sabbath, you can't really go anywhere because the Sabbath was a day of rest and we've created laws that, that, that keep you in certain places. But they also have created uh, loopholes even in the laws because on the sabbath you could leave as long as you're tied to your house and so you could you could travel so many feet from your house 
and you were okay. But go beyond that and you broke the law. And so what they would do is they would tie a string to their house and then they tie it to that point and then they would tie it there and they'd go up further and they would say, oh, our house is still at this point and now we can go out further. Oh, it's still at that point and they could travel a little bit longer by finding loopholes, you know? And that's how they got around it. and that's what the law does, right? Because you can't live by the law. You end up breaking the law and Jesus says, I've done away with that, trying to live by the law. You now live by grace. I went to the cross, I laid my life on it, your sins were laid on me, and the guilt of sin was taken care of. You still sin, but the guilt was taken care of. You're no longer guilty, as long as you surrender to me. You don't have to offer up a sacrifice. All you now have to do is confess your sins. And he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness, First John 1, 9. And so now we come into a deep, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, where we surrender ourselves to him in him alone and so thus you fulfill both jesus fulfilled both uh, the law in that he never broke the law he fulfilled the law and in that uh, he brought grace to a dying world a disciple of jesus christ should know this <clears throat> is how one ought to live is by grace let me close with some application. You know, the disciples, in, a, in applying this freedom of grace, they would begin to defile the law. We find in Matthew 12, the disciples began to pluck, pluck uh, the ears of grain on the Sabbath day. Oh, that's a defilement of the law. We find that um, they would eat uh, bread with unwashed hands. Oh, that's a defilement of the law. Uh, they would then defile... Uh, and do certain things on the Sabbath again, which the religious leaders would <sighs> condemn. But it was a freedom, a freedom that they found in Jesus. Not a freedom to sin, because Paul was clear that we're not to sin, nor are we to take our grace as a license to continue to sin. A Christian is a mind through which Christ thinks. Here's the application. A Christian, you and I, allow Christ to think through us. We take on the mind of Christ. Colossians, we put on Christ Jesus. We put off the old man, very clear. Peter said it, it is not the circumcision that matters. It is the new creation that's in our hearts. So we put on Christ's mind and we think like Christ or we allow Christ to think through us. That means that when you have a thought that's contrary to Christ, you let Christ's thought come through you, right? So, so if you have a philosophy that you think is right, and then God's word comes and gives you his philosophy, then you throw your philosophy aside and say, that's what's right, because you're allowing Christ to think through you. A heart through which Christ loves. A disciple is a heart, is a Christian's heart, which Christ loves. So you allow Christ's love through you. So you might not like someone, but you let Christ love them through you. You stand aside and you let Christ show through your life. It's a voice through which Christ speaks. So now you speak Christianese. <laughs> You're right? you, you speak Christians. And you remember that when you first got saved? You're like, praise the Lord. And they're like, praise, where'd you get that from? I don't know, I just have it now, you know. Praise God, hallelujah. Where are all those? Oh, are you a Jesus freak now, you know? I get asked the question almost every year, but people always ask me, uh, why don't you, or why do you hate Santa so much? You know, because I don't have Santa Clauses or anything like that in my, my house. I just, I threw that stuff away. I gave it up. I said, I don't hate Santa. I just love Jesus more. You know, and that's so foreign to people. They don't get that. A lot of Christians don't get that. We still hold on to our old traditions, you know. You'll hear things like the congregation, you know, or the parishioners. You're like, where's that word come from? That's our Catholic tradition. We're the body of Christ. We're brothers and sisters. We're not parishioners. You know, yeah, we are in the sense we belong to an organization, but we're the body of Christ. Mass. Let's go to Mass. Mass. We're not having a Mass. We're having fellowship and communion with the Word of God. We're studying the Word of God. And these are all traditions that God wants to get rid of uh, completely. So we let the voice of God speak through us. And then His hands 
that we can help other, right? So we, we serve, and we allow God to serve through us. Does it get tiring serving? Yeah. I get tired all the time, but I allow Christ to serve it with through me. So when I'm serving, I put on a song, I put on the word of God, I meditate upon those things because my body doesn't want to do it, maybe even my mind doesn't want to do it, but I allow Christ to do it because I know the work needs to be done. Let me say that again, and I hope you write this down because it, this is a philosophy that works, and it will change your life if you apply it to your life. It really will for the better. A Christian, a disciple of Christ, is a mind through which Christ thinks, a heart through which Christ loves, a voice through which Christ speaks, a hand through which Christ helps. That's a disciple of Jesus Christ.